Yeah, okay, great. Well, welcome everyone to our uh, virtual seminar series from the SIAM Financial Math and Engineering Group. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to have, uh, uh, have you all here today and uh, we're excited about our, our upcoming talk. Before the, introducing the speaker, I just wanted to mention a few things about uh, the logistics. So the talk is going to be 45 minutes and we'll have uh, take questions mostly towards the end unless there's uh, some burning question in the middle, uh, we can, you can uh, ask them. And I do ask that you post your questions into the chat so that we can see the questions and then we will ask uh, if you would like to be uh, to be unmuted and turn on your video to ask the question towards the towards the end. Um, we as well after the seminar and the official Q and A session, we're going to have a meet and greet session and just gathering for everyone who wants to hang out, hang around and, and chat about uh, the talk and uh, other things related to math finance. Uh, just stay around and we'll all promote everyone up to the video and, and um, voice. Uh, <coughs> and uh, as mentioned on the slide there, we, our next talk coming up on June 25th is uh, by Jean-Pierre Fouque, uh, but we'll say more about that at the end. So. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Patrick Picciardito. He's a full professor of mathematics at ETH Zurich, where he's the director of Risk Lab, uh, Switzerland. He's a member of the steering committee of the ETH Risk Center and serves on the board of the Swiss Association of Actuaries. Uh, Patrick's research interests are in stochastic modeling, mathematical finance, quantitative risk management, and insurance mathematics. He's an associate editor for a number of journals, including SIAM Journal of Financial Mathematics, Mathematical Finance, and Mathematics of Operations Research. And today we have the pleasure of hearing Patrick's talk on deep optimal stopping. So Patrick, please uh, take it away. You can start uh, sharing your screen and I'm gonna spotlight video you. Okay, thanks so much for having me in this uh, online seminar. So today I'll talk about this paper, Deep Optimal Stopping, and it's together with uh, Sebastian Becker uh, from Zenai, which is a startup in Zurich here in Switzerland, and Arnold Jensen, which is at the University of Münster. Um, so as we all know, of course, deep learning has produced spectacular results in uh, image classification, speech recognition, machine translation, game intelligence, and other application areas, um, but it can also be used as numerical methods to solve uh, mathematical problems. And so recently there have been various papers that uh, approximate solutions of PDEs with uh, neural networks and that's a partial list here. And more recently there have also been attempts to even show uh, approximation rates. Um, similarly, there have been uh, papers that uh, solve uh, control problems with uh, neural networks and uh, deep learning. And also, this is a very incomplete list here. And uh, so today we will uh, study optimal stopping. Um, so optimal stopping, of course, is a special case of a control problem and it can also be approached uh, uh, through uh, the associated uh, free boundary PDE. But since it's uh, an important problem in uh, finance and economics, uh, it has its own specialized literature. Um, and so in most cases, these problems cannot be solved exactly. So they have to, be, have to be approximated. And in low dimensions, meaning if there is one, two or three space dimensions, usually a binomial tree, lattice or a PDE approximation method works very well. Uh, but of course, these problems suffer from the curse of dimensionality. And uh, so for higher dimensions, maybe five space dimensions, 10, 20 or more, uh, various Monte Carlo methods have been developed. And to my knowledge, the first two papers that have been doing this was uh, Tilly and Carrière, who proposed a bundling algorithm and a polynomial regression or also spline regression to iteratively estimate uh, continuation values. Um, and then after that, there was a variety of uh, interesting uh, approaches. Uh, so maybe the most often cited paper is uh, longstoff schwartz which also uses polynomial regression. And then uh, Rogers and Ho and Kogan a bit later uh, developed a dual formulation of the optimal um, stopping problem, which will also be important to us. And then after that, 
And maybe we also note that Ho and Corgan already proposed to use a neural network regression at that time to solve the primal problem. And then after that, there have been more sophisticated uh, neural network regression methods and other sophisticated proposals to solve this problem. And again, I apologize if I haven't listed everybody that recently has worked on this. Um, so the problem that we are going to study here is uh, this maximum expectation problem where X is an underlying Markov process, which is D dimensional and then D is potentially large, like five, 10, 50, 100, or even 500. Uh, G is a payoff function, which can depend on the time and also on the underlying state. Um, just needs to be measurable and it needs to be such that uh, this square integrability condition is satisfied. Okay, and the set calligraphic tau over which we take the supremum here is just a set of all x stopping times tau, uh, meaning this stopping time can only stop uh, based on information that is based uh, until the time when it wants to stop. Okay, so just a few words about the assumption. So we pose this problem uh, directly in discrete time. Uh, so many problems are already in discrete time. Um, and most relevant continuous time problems can be approximated by discretized, uh, time discretized versions. Um, then about the Markov assumption, so we also make it because it's convenient and many problems are already in Markov form. Uh, but it's not really a restriction because uh, every discrete time stochastic process can be made Markov by just including all the relevant information in the current state. Uh, okay. Although this incre increases, of course, the dimension then of the underlying state process. Um, so the approach we take here is um, in contrast to most of the existing approaches, uh, direct policy search. Okay, so we don't try to approximate the value function. Uh, there is no regression, but we directly try to find an optimal uh, strategy. Um, so we also do this iteratively. And to do that, we introduce a sequence of uh, auxiliary stopping problems. Um, at each time n, uh, we define Vn to be the maximal expectation that can be attained by stopping between time n and capital N. Okay, and then we introduce uh, stopping decisions which are functions on Rd, which is the underlying state space that take the value zero or one and one will mean that we stop and zero will mean, will mean that we continue at this, uh, at this specific time n. And the last of these stopping decisions F capital N is always equal to one because at the end you have to stop. Okay, so there is no other way. Um, then uh, using these uh, stopping decisions, we build a stopping time tau n, which is the sum MFM multiplied with this product here. And this just means the stopping time is equal to the time M at which for the first time the function FM based on the underlying process X is equal to one. And this product here afterwards will become zero. So this just makes sure that you don't stop twice. Okay, so you can only stop once you have to stop between time little n and capital n and uh, so this parameterizes a family of stopping rules so the good thing is for any arbitrary sequence of stopping decisions fn up to uh, f capital n up here this defines a valid stopping rule okay it doesn't define i mean it doesn't cover all the possible stopping rules because in theory you could also make uh, your decision dependent on what happened in the past and uh, these stopping rules only make the stopping decision based on the current underlying state. But due to the Markov assumption we make, uh, this will be enough to find uh, a good stopping time. Okay, and now the idea is to try uh, to recursively try to find the uh, optimal uh, stopping decisions Fn, which are just functions from Rd and take the value either zero or one. 
Okay, and so to justify this approach, we have this little result here, which says that if you have a stopping time tau n plus one, which stops between n plus one and the final time, and is of this form, for some measurable functions which describe your stopping decisions, and you denote by epsilon the gap between the optimal value that can be attained and the value produced by this stopping rule tau n plus one, then at time n, you find a stopping decision fn, such that if you stop, if it says, if it tells you to stop at time n, and if you continue, if it tells you to continue and then continue according to the stopping time tau n plus one. And this expression is nothing else than this same expression that we saw before. Then this new composed stopping rule that stops between n and capital N, is no further away from the optimal stopping value at time n than, than this epsilon mean. Okay, so this is a result that is very close to a standard classical result that tells you that an optimal stopping rule exists and you obtain this result from this little proposition just by starting with the obvious stopping rule at the final time and then going back and setting this epsilon equal to zero all the time. Uh, but since we're going to approximate our stopping decisions, uh, for us, the epsilon will not be zero, so it will be a small number. And this result tells us that we make, if we make small mistakes in every time step, it will not mess up the whole procedure if we go back to some time. Okay, and then, uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to try to recursively approximate the stopping decisions Fn by neural networks. And so in theory, you could uh, choose any neural network architecture here. And so, but, but since we didn't have like an idea which one would be best, we just choose a thread forward, uh, a feed forward neural network uh, with two hidden layers here. And again, so you could choose more hidden layers, but two hidden layers worked well for the examples that we were looking at. Um, so what's a, neur a, a, a neural network? Uh, so it's a composition of affine transformations with nonlinear transformations. Um, the Q1 and Q2 here um, denotes the number of uh, nodes that we have in the two hidden layers. So that would be the numbers uh, of nodes in this first hidden layer and the number of nodes in the second hidden layer here. And then the A1 theta, A2 theta and A3 theta are uh, affine transformations. So they are represented by matrices, AI and vectors BI. And uh, the components of these matrices and these vectors uh, form the parameter vector theta. Okay, and then finally we have nonlinear transformations. And again, one could choose any nonlinear transformations or the most popular are hyperbolic tangent logistic function or the so-called ReLU activation function, which is the positive part. So it takes a J-dimensional vector and then just returns the positive part of all the components. And then since we tried to find the stopping decision here, in the end, we also apply this characteristic function, which is one if the final outcome was positive and is zero if the, if the final outcome after this last uh, fn transformation was negative. Okay, and so how are we going to optimize or train the work network now? So we assume that at time n, we have already found good parameter values theta n plus one up to theta capital N, uh, such that the final stopping decision is always a stop for sure. And the corresponding stopping rule tau n plus one produces an expected payoff that is close to the optimal value that you can achieve uh, by stopping between, between n plus one and uh, time capital N. Um, so now at time n, we try to find the parameter vector theta n that maximizes the expectation of the immediate payoff if you decide to stop immediately or the payoff given to you if you decide to continue 
and then behave according to this stopping time tau n plus one that you trained before. Okay. Um, and so maybe I shortly go back. Uh, so this is going to be a difficult problem because theta might be high dimensional. It might be 250,000 dimensional. It might be 500,000 dimensional. And we will not be able to calculate this expectation exactly. Okay, so typically what you do in this framework, you use a stochastic gradient method, method in the parameter space. Um, but there is a little problem. So the stopping decision f theta is this uh, indicator function composed with the neural network. But this indicator function is zero or one. And so the gradient of this is zero or it does not even exist. So that's not good for a stochastic gradient method. So as an intermediate step, what we do is we replace the hard stopping decision, which is given by this characteristic function by a soft stopping decision, which is given by this logistic function here. So this function smoothly increases from zero to one. And in particular, it's differentiable. Okay, so this whole function capital F theta now will be differentiable with respect to the theta vector, except that some points since we chose this uh, ReLU activation function where there is a kink, but the probability that you fall into one of those kinks is zero. So that's not going to be a big, a big problem. Um, so now you simulate paths, a little x k n of the underlying Markov process and use a stochastic gradient descent uh, to recursively find an approximate uh, optimizer theta n of this Monte Carlo sum here. You, so now you just sum your objective function over along your uh, simulated trajectories of the underlying Markov process. And this approximates your expectation. So instead of uh, trying to maximize the expectation itself, you try to maximize this Monte Carlo average approximation of the expectation. Okay, so these will be complicated functions to maximize. The parameter space you maximize over will be high dimensional, but you try to use a stochastic, uh, a stochastic gradient method. And of course, uh, TensorFlow or any other uh, package will help you here. Um, and then in every time step, what we do after we have trained the parameter, we switch back the soft, uh, the soft uh, stopping decision into a hard stopping decision just by saying, if the soft, soft stopping rule uh, was above one half, we stop. And if the soft stopping rule was below one half, uh, we continue. Okay, just to have a true stopping rule now. And then we repeat the same procedure backwards at times n minus one, n minus two, back to zero. Uh, and so one proposition that you can prove here is that uh, if you're at any time n and you fix some stopping time tau n plus one, which tells you how to behave after time n plus one, and there is some approximation error epsilon, then there exist uh, hidden nodes Q1 and Q2, such that the supremum over the co corresponding neural networks with two hidden layers and this many uh, neurons in the hidden layers uh, will be epsilon close to the supremum over all possible measurable functions. And we saw before that if you maximize over all possible measurable functions, then you will be close to the, to the true optimum of the problem. Um, so a short proof here is uh, in a first step, you note that uh, every measurable set A in RD can be approximated in measure from within by a compact set. And in a second step, you can approximate the characteristic function on the compact set minus the characteristic function outside of the compact set by a continuous function just by using the distance function. And then you use a classical universal approximation result, which even holds for uh, neural networks with one hidden layer, which tells you that you can approximate any continuous function on compacts arbitrarily well with a neural network of this form. So this is just a neural network with one hidden layer. 
Uh, but once you have an approximation result for a neural network with one hidden layer, you also have it with uh, two or more hidden layers because you can always compose uh, identities and writing those as the layers of a, of a neural network. Okay, so as a corollary, we have that uh, any uh, optimal stopping problem of the form that we consider and for any constant uh, epsilon, uh, there exists number of hidden nodes Q1 and Q2 and uh, functions parameterized as neural networks of the form that we saw before, such that the last stopping decision is always equal to one and the corresponding stopping time satisfies uh, expectation of the payoff is epsilon close to the optimal expectation of this problem okay so in theory there is a network that uh, solves this problem for us uh, well enough that's good but of course we have uh, no rate and not really an idea how large we have to choose this neural network um, so but on the other hand the good thing is uh, whenever you write a stopping decision in terms of neural networks in this form it's a valid stopping decision so it's a valid policy so it always gives you a lower bound. Okay, so this is not the optimal stopping decision, but it is a stopping, a stopping rule. So it gives you a lower bound. Uh, this is still theoretical because we will not be able to calculate this expectation. So what we do is we simulate a new uh, set of paths of the underlying Markov process, uh, write this stopping rule as a measurable function of the underlying process. Uh, denote the stopping uh, time along the case trajectory as LK and then use the Monte Carlo average over those simulated trajectories as an estimate of uh, the lower bound L. Okay and then in an additional step we can uh, calculate the sample variance and by the central limit theorem, this will give us an asymptotically valid one minus alpha confidence interval for the theoretical lower bound, where C alpha here is a one minus alpha quantile of the standard normal distribution. Okay, so we have a theoretical lower bound. We cannot directly calculate it, but we can estimate it with the confidence, uh, with confidence bounds. Um, as a consequence, this same interval will also be uh, a confidence interval for the optimal value of the problem V0 because it will be above the theoretical lower bound. Okay, and then on the other hand, we can also calculate an upper bound. And so for this, we denote by Hn the Snell envelope of the payoff process uh, Gn uh, with uh, the corresponding loop composition. And then we have uh, a little variant of uh, dual formulation of optimal stopping rules that have appeared in Rogers, Hall, Corwin, and also Anderson Brody, which tells you on the one hand, the optimal value can be written as this expectation of this pathwise maximum over the payoff process minus the Martingale part of the Snell angle. On the other hand, if you take any Martingale M that starts at zero, and also if you have estimation errors epsilon that are conditionally on bias, since you have a maximum here, this expectation will always be above the optimal value V0. So to estimate an upper bound now, the strategy is to try to construct a, a martingale that is close to the martingale part of the Snell envelope and we use it by using the solution to the primal problem to the to the to the optimal stopping problem. Okay, um, so m theta n is the martingale part of the value process generated by the stopping decision that we trained earlier. Uh, then we have to use nested simulations to generate realizations of the martingale uh, plus and there will be an estimation error coming from the nested simulation. But as long as this estimation error is unbiased, it will give a true upper bound. And you can also see in the implementation, if you use more simulations in the inner simulations of the nested simulation, uh, this, app, this estimation error will decrease.
decrease and the upper bound will become tighter. Um, so again, uh, this u will be a theoretical upper bound, but we will not be able to calculate the expectation exactly. So we simulate another set of uh, trajectories of the underlying Markov process and estimate the upper bound by uh, the corresponding uh, Monte Carlo average. The point estimate we use then is simply the average between the point estimate for the lower bound and the upper bound. And again, by the central limit theorem, we can produce a one-sided confidence interval uh, for the theoretical upper bound. And then in the end, we can combine the two one-sided confidence intervals that we derived for the lower bound and for the upper bound, which gives us a two-sided one minus two alpha confidence interval for the value of the theory. Um, okay, so this was, a bit of uh, uh, explanation how we do this and why this should work. And, and now I want to discuss, uh, if time permits, uh, three examples. Um, so the first is the Bermudan max call option. And this is probably the most studied example in at least the academic literature. So we saw a lot of uh, different approaches in this, but, uh, apply to this example. Um, so here we have the uh, assets, stock prices, for example, which uh, follow as an exponential Brownian motion, but could also follow another process as long as you are able to simulate it uh, efficiently. Uh, initial values as uh, S0i, risk free interest rate R, dividend yields, volatilities, and, uh, and W is a d dimensional Brownian motion, and you can also have correlation between the components of the Brownian motions. Uh, then the payoff of a max call option is. Uh, the difference between the maximum over the different assets minus the strike price if the difference is positive and zero otherwise. And it can be exercised at uh, one or finitely many times uh, between zero and the maturity. Um, so the price of such an option is the supremum of this expectation where the supremum is over stopping times that uh, uh, take values in uh, on this time grid now. And so just note that I can write this in my generic form, just by letting uh, the S uh, stock prices here be the components of X and the function G be the, the, this function max minus K plus. Uh, okay, and then just to show you our price estimates here. And so up here are the parameters. So we let all these prices start at, at 100. We let them all have volatility equal to 20%. And uh, then there is a dividend yield and the correlation here is zero. Uh, but we, you could choose any specification here. We chose this specification because it's the specification that was chosen in most of the other papers where this uh, example was studied. And so in the first column here, we show the number of assets. So the first line is two assets. The second line is uh, three assets. And uh, the second column shows our point estimates. This is the computation time, but we use the GPUs here. And these are our confidence intervals. And in dimension two and three, you can do this problem with the binomial tree. So in two dimensions, I think you can do 2000 steps or so. So in three dimensions, it's becoming more uh, costly. So you can do less steps. And also the precision is, uh, is less stitches after, the, after the, uh, the decimal point here. Uh, but what you see already here, our method uh, leads, gives results which are very close to the binomial tree results. And then in dimension five, we use uh, this paper by Brody and Cow as a reference. And so they produced a very tight confidence interval. And so our method gives a similarly tight confidence interval and also agrees with their, with their values. And then we also run the method in much higher dimensions, uh, 10, 20, 30, 50, up to 500. And we still have tight confidence interval the computation time grows, but it doesn't grow dramatically. Okay, um, so then the question was, uh, how difficult is this example really? And so we were asking around a bit to maybe have an example which is maybe somehow discontinuous. 
And so a product that is popular in low interest rate environment is uh, caudal multi-barrier reverse convertibles. Okay, so this is a coupon bank paying security, which uh, converts into the worst of the underlying assets if a barrier event occurs. And if it's a callable version, uh, then it can be redeemed by the issuer early at one of finitely many times t1 t2 uh, up to tn minus one before the maturity um, so then we calculated this result even though this is a a worst uh, optimal uh, a worst stopping problem not you don't so the issuer typically tries to minimize the value of this product so the issuer tries to redeem this product so that all in all, uh, the value is minimized uh, to the customer, obviously. And so we started a version here with uh, one year maturity um, with a coupon payment every month, a notional of 100, an annualized coupon of 7%, and that's why they're popular. So even if, uh, so this example is from Switzerland. So in Switzerland, the uh, interest rates are negative. And, uh, and this product pays you a seven, an annualized uh, uh, coupon of 7%. Uh, but of course, there is this risk that you're going to lose something. And, and so here we set the barrier equal to, equal to 70%, which means you have uh, two, three, or five underlying assets. And if any one of those assets drops uh, below 70% of their initial value, then this product converts into this asset. It stops paying coupons. And instead of uh, owning this coupon paying instrument, then you own this uh, underlying stock, which happens to be the worst one of the, of the underlying stocks because it was the one that first uh, uh, went below the barrier. Um, the barrier violation is checked daily here. And we assume the correlation of 10% uh, between, between the underlying assets. Um, and so usually, these pro that the products that we have seen have two or three underlying assets. So sometimes as a customer, you can choose the underlying assets that you want to use. Um, and so here we did up to 30, so it worked well. I don't really know if it's relevant, but uh, also in two and three dimensions, we obtain uh, good results. Uh, and we could also, also we used uh, geometric Brownian motion here, but we could also use more complicated models like stochastic volatility or a local volatility model. Here. And just to explain the results shortly here. So again, the first column is the number of underlying assets. The second column is uh, the point estimate of the callable version. Third column is the computation time that we needed to evaluate this. This column is the, the confidence interval. And then as a comparison, we also calculated the non-callable version of this product. So this is just a, a product that has a trigger event and then converts if the trigger event happens. And so there is no control. So they, these can be evaluated just by a standard Monte Carlo. So these are easy. Um, but just to show that with a notional of 100, the non-callable version is above 100 almost always, except in the last case where there, when there are 30 underlying assets. And the callable version is uh, considerably uh, worth less, uh, especially in high dimensions. Okay, so that worked well also. And then so as a last example, uh, we wanted to have something which is maybe not directly finance related, which is uh, optimally stopping a fractional Brownian motion, but then in a wider sense, it could be finance related because uh, there are these new models that uh, use a fractional Brownian motion to model volatility. Um, so just to remind everybody, a fractional Brownian motion um, has a Hurst parameter between uh, zero and one. Um, it is a continuous centered Gaussian process uh, with this covariance structure. And if you plug in H equal to one half, this just gives you the covariance structure of a Brownian motion. So if H is equal to one half, this process is a Brownian motion. And so down here, I simulated a typical path of a Brownian motion. So it's really like this. And then for H bigger than one half, a fractional Brownian motion has positive 
positively correlated increment. So I simulated a path for h equal to 0.8 here. And since the increments are positively correlated, it tends to make the, the path of such a process smoother than, a, than the path of a Gaussian motion. On the other hand, if you choose h below one half, and here I have a typical path for h equal to 0.1, then since the increments are negatively correlated, that the path tend to be rougher. And, uh, and if you simulate them, look, it could look like this. Okay. So the problem now is uh, um, you have time between zero and one and you can stop at any time, but only based on the information that you have by, pro, uh, by, by uh, uh, observing the process up to this time. And you want to stop the process so that you maximize the expectation. Okay, and so first we have to discretize this problem. So here we did a uh, hundred time steps. And then as I was mentioning in the beginning, so this is not a Markov process. So to make this a Markov problem now, what we have to do is we have to add all the past information into the current state. So originally this is a one dimensional problem, but it's not Markov. And so now what we do is we carry all the past values of this process. So it becomes a hundred dimensional problem. Um, and so now we study the discretized stopping problem, which is a soup over uh, stopping times that take values uh, on this discrete, uh, discrete uh, time grid. And uh, G is the function uh, which just uh, takes the first component of a hundred dimensional vector here. And then again, it's, uh, it's the stopping problem is of our general form. And it approximates the continuous time problem that I have up here and it converges to it when you make the discretization final and final. Okay, and then so the first paper probably that has studied this problem is this paper by Kulikov and Kusiotnikov. And so they studied uh, heuristic stopping rules, which are of the form, well, if one uh, increment is positive and the increments are positively correlated, then maybe it's better to continue and not stop. And if the if one increment is negative and the increments are positively correlated, maybe it's better to stop. And so what you see here is the values produced by heuristic stopping rules of this form for different thresholds. Uh, like if this increment was higher than this value, we continue. If it's below this value, we stop. So these are simple stopping rules. And also I want to point out that if the H, H parameter is one half, which is here, then the process is a Brownian motion. So no matter what you do, you will not be able to stop this so that you have an expectation different from zero. If the H parameter is equal to one, then you have positive, perfectly positively correlated increments, which means the process is a straight line with a random slope. And so if you think about this, what's the optimal stopping rule in this, in this situation? Well, what you do is you watch the first little increment. If it's positive, you just wait until the end because it will, the process will increase in the, along this trajectory. And if it's negative, then you stop immediately and you can calculate the value of the stopping rule. And it is uh, one divided by square root of two pi, which is 0.39 something. And that's was also what they obtain here uh, with, with this heuristic stopping rule. Okay. And also these values here are not too bad. And, and, but now I shortly want to discuss what you would do if the increments were negatively correlated. And so I think, I believe this is, diffi is a difficult problem now. Uh, because what would you do? Because if the first little increment is positive, then the next one is more likely to be uh, negative. And then the one after that is really not so clear because it will depend on how positive the first, the first one was and how negative the second one was. So, so we believe this is a really complicated high dimensional problem. And uh, so these are the values that they obtained here and not because they didn't uh, study this problem hard enough, but because I think this is just a difficult problem. And, uh, and so for comparison now, this is what we obtained with our uh, algorithms here. And so you see again for H equal to 0.5, we obtain uh, zero. 
for h equal to one, we obtained this one divided by square root of two pi, so that's good. Uh, then for h values above one half and below one, we obtained slightly better results than uh, were obtained in this paper by, paper by these uh, heuristic stopping rules. But then for h below one half, we obtain dramatically better results than uh, than from the, this uh, heuristic stopping rule. And that's all that I wanted to say. And I thank you all for listening. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Patrick, for a very interesting talk. Uh, there are, you know, I encourage everyone to post uh, their questions into the box, and we'll we'll. Uh, ask you to unmute and ask them uh, yourselves. Uh, in the interim, we do have a couple of questions. So first, uh, Augustino, uh, would you please, uh, you can go ahead and ask yours. You're already, already yeah. visible. Visible, okay. Thank you, Patrick. I think this was uh, extremely interesting. I had a question about uh, your convergence theorem, the one where you basically yeah, explain the convergence of the stopping rule. Uh, is there any dependence uh, on the network structure? Meaning, can you, please, is it possible to say anything about uh, how, I mean, whether or not we want to have a deeper network with a uh, smaller number of neurons per layer, or we want to have uh, less deep, I mean, smaller depth, so few layers, but more neurons uh, per layer, and how will the convergence depend on this trade-off? Okay, um, so that's a very interesting question, and it's a hot research topic right now, of course. So this paper was written three years ago. So we basically wanted to see if it works if we apply it to this problem, right? And so the approximation result that I have here is uh, old <laughs> in the sense that it uses a universal approximation result from 93. So if I find it, uh, uh, yeah, here. So it uses this classical universal approximation result from 93. Okay. Yep. And these are usually formulated with uh, neural networks with one hidden layer, and they usually don't have rates, but they just tell you that uh, if there is an epsilon, there will be a number of neuro neurons that, uh, um, that will approximate this epsilon closely. I mean, there are results that uh, talk about uniform convergence or LP convergence. Uh, there is one uh, paper by Barron which sort gives you a result, uh, but it's also for one hidden layer neural networks. And of course, um, in more recent years, it was observed that in different problems, uh, neural networks with more hidden layers work better. And, right. and, and I don't have much to say about it here, except that different people are trying to understand what kind of functions you can approximate with what kind of uh, neural networks and we have some partial results for uh, solutions of pdes but not in this context here because here we approximate the stopping rule we don't approximate the value of the problem great thank you Patrick. okay uh next question we have is from uh mikhail uh mikhail i think you're here would you like to uh unmute yourself and turn on your video to ask the question hello uh, so my question is, in which sense uh, do you understand 95% uh, confidence intervals uh, in your tables about max call? Just because the underlying uh, distribution is probably very complicated uh, when you train this network. Yes, yes, the distribution is very complicated, but then we have sums and we have sums with approximately 4 million terms. So we invoke the central limit theorem here so that we are uh, close to a normal distribution if we look at the normalized sum of these simulations. And then we use the quantiles of a normal distribution. Uh, you mean, uh, do you have normal distribution on the testing uh, phase of the algorithm? Or yes, yes. Okay, so I made a, I made a square integrability assumption in the beginning. And then I'm looking at uh, sums of this form. Okay, 
So these will be realizations of random variables that will be square integrable. I simulate them independently of each other. So the KL will be one, two or four million. So I think for the results that we have, it was approximately four million. So if you go ever going to invoke the central limit, you know, <laughs> then probably yeah. opportunity to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay, great. Up next, uh, Anatoly. I think you're already on here. Can you uh, unmute yourself and um, put, turn on your video? Oh, sorry. Actually, I think there's a, not, in fact, a question attached to that. That was a comment. <laughs> Thanking you for a great talk. My mistake. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, Patrick. So the next question is actually from Harvey, Harvey Stein. I think Harvey is already uh, um, promoted here. So can you unmute yourself and ask the question, Harvey? Sure. Yes. So, so I had a question about the last uh, results you were showing, comparing that uh, approximation to, uh, to your results. It was on your last uh, slide. This was well, on the thank you. On the fractional brownie motion? Yes, exactly. Okay. So the qu my question was, it looks like your results, the uh, the function isn't isn't uh, differentiable at h equals one half, which it seems like kind of odd. Okay. I was wondering if you had an explanation for that. No, I don't. I mean, this is just uh, simulation results we got. Um, so again, for h equal to one half and then h equal to one, they correspond to the theoretical solutions that we can derive. Mm -hmm. Also, we calculated lower bounds and upper bounds that I don't show you here, but they were, if I would plot them here, you wouldn't see the difference from this line here. Mm -hmm. So they were very, were very tight. So, so I believe in these results and I, I don't know, I don't know if the, this function here should be differentiable at uh, one half, but it's a good question, I don't know. <laughs> You would think that uh, either, you know, marginal additional correlation would either not have a big impact if it's sufficiently small, in which case it would be differentiable, or it could be leveraged to such an extent that the results would be arbitrarily high and you'd have a discontinuity. I, I really don't know. I mean, I also have to say we didn't, I mean, we calculated these values for H on a time grid, which was uh, 0 0.05, I think. And, and then we just interpolated. So we can't really tell whether it's differential here or not. Right. So, okay. So this also could be, this also could be an artifact of the discretization in time. I mean, we as, all, we all as the discretization went to infinity, the, the, uh, it might, the solution might blow up. It could be, so that I don't know, so, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Actually, yeah. quick question related to that. Uh, any, any idea as to why it's convex to the left of a half and, and concave to the right? Well, apparently. I don't know. I mean, honestly, at some other presentation, I also got the result, what happens if H is going to zero? So if, if would this line go to infinity or not? And would it go to infinity for a t fixed time discretization or would it go maybe to infinity if I made the time discretization finer and finer? And, and these are all interesting questions, but I didn't study this problem like theoretically carefully. So maybe one could say more about uh, what's happening, but at, at this point, I really don't know. Okay, great. Uh, I see Meta, you've anticipated uh, you're up next. <laughs> you're already unmuted in video and force, so please go ahead. Hi, Meta. <laughs> Hi, Patrick. Thank you for the talk. Uh, so my question goes back at the very beginning. I'm a convergence result. So not the rate, but the convergence. So as the simulations, now Monte Carlo simulations goes to infinity and then the size of the network goes to infinity. In this direction, you have convergence, right? Um, okay, again, so we didn't study this uh, this uh, three years ago. We tried to study it a bit here, a bit now on different on different problems. But 
I mean, typically you have like different uh, parameters that you can send to infinity. So one is the, the network size. Mm -hmm. And so then typically you have results, uh, how well can a given network structure approximate some continuous function or some continuous function in, in a specific class of functions, for example. And so again, so here I'm just using classical results, which tell you if you give me an epsilon, there is a large enough network that can have approximate epsilon close. There are newer results now that give you more precise information. Well, I'm, but on the other hand, I'm interested in the interaction between the Monte Carlo and approximation of the expected value and that one. I mean, so and I mean, the so second you have to send a number of simulations to infinity as well, right? The second parameter that you have here is the number of data that you have. And I mean, also here, we can have in a good situation because we're in a mathematical problem. So we simulate that because in these problems that I mentioned in the beginning, um, image classification or speech recognition, usually these are based on real data. So they only have the data that they have. And, and often they, I mean, this is kind of the bottleneck of their method, how much data they have, but here, we just simulate as much, for us, simulation is cheap here. So we simulate from a geometric Brownian motion or whatever. So as I mentioned, we simulate up to one, two, four million times is cheap for us. Mm -hmm. And then what you have is you have an approximation, which is here, right? Which is uh, the difference between the expectation and the Monte Carlo approximation. Mm -hmm. uh, but for us, this is small because uh, what we do is we train on one set of simulations and then we evaluate on a new independent set of, of uh, simulations. And usually for us, this is small because again, we just simulate as much as we have to. So what are the typical sizes? Do you remember, I mean, the, the, the numeric, um, the, approximate, the, the simulations, number of simulations, and also the parameters in the, in the neural network, the, the, the comparison. One is most likely you're taking a lot more simulations than the number of parameters in the neural nets, right? Yes, yes. So, so we do up to 4 million simulations. Uh, I don't remember exactly because we do training. So maybe you do 4 million simulations yeah. for training. But then we also calculate these confidence intervals on new uh, sets of simulations, yeah. as I was explaining uh, earlier. Your neural network is how big? Is your neural network? Okay, um, so the neural network is big. So what we have here, typically what we do is we, in the input layer, you have as many neurons as high dimensional your problem is. So okay. for a 500 dimensional problem, you would have 500 neurons here. Mm -hmm. And so typically what we take in the two hidden layers is maybe 500 plus 10 or something, or 500 plus 50 uh, of the same order. Mm. But since you have matrices in these, uh, in these affine transformations, yeah. these matrices will be 500 times 500. So you will have uh, 250,000 entries in each of those matrices. You have three of those matrices. So you already have 750,000 parameters. So it is more or less still the same number of simulations as the parameters. Right? We right. do a bit of more, we do a bit more simulations. Um, Okay. And, and I think, I mean, again, then on top of that, there is also the stochastic gradient descent, right? Which is maybe hardest to understand because uh, uh, these problems are not convex. And so for convex problems, we have like theoretical results that show you even with rates, how the stochastic gradient descent converges. But these uh, problems are not convex in theta. Um, so, I think <laughs> this is maybe the hardest problem to understand. And again, people are working on it right now. Um, but, but I mean, the advantage that we have here is really that we understand the problem and we know how to calculate lower and upper bounds. So mm -hmm. I can always a posteriori calculate lower and upper bounds and get guarantees after I have trained the neural network. Thank you, Pat. Okay, great. And uh, I guess this will be our last question as we're ending, getting to the end of the time allocated, and then we'll move into the more uh, informal uh, meet and greet and chat and comments, etc. Uh, so up next, uh, Sergio, do you, I think you're already promoted up and uh, you can unmute yourself and turn on your video and ask your question. Uh, can you hear me and see me? Yes. Okay. Hi, yes. All right. Hi, how are you, Patrick? Thank you Hi. for the talk. 
Uh, for the last example of fractional Brownian motion, uh, so you consider for your state variable, the whole past of at each time you consider all the previous values, uh, which is the right thing to do given that you have a non-Markovian process. But I just was wondering if you numerically uh, study the impact of kind of reducing the dimensionality there and maybe including only some previous times, like in the spirit of the heuristics uh, that you talked about at some point. Yes, um, we didn't do this. I mean, of course, um, you could do it, but since the method works and uh, we have enough computational power to do the full problem, I mean, so this question, this problem, the complexity of this problem depends on the number of time steps you make. So we could approximately do 100 time steps and 200 time steps would have been too difficult, right? Uh, so we just control this, uh, the complexity of this by how many time steps we make here. Okay. Um, um, but you could but if, if you increase if you increase the number of steps, then you would have this constraint maybe that you have. I mean, if you do 200 time steps here, then it's becoming a 200 dimensional problem. If you do 500, it's becoming, so it's, okay. it's becoming more and more complex. But um, you could also try to do a thousand time steps, but then maybe not use all the past information, but only recent uh, past information. But uh, th that's something we didn't try. Okay. That was my question. Thanks again for the talk. Thank you. Sure. Excellent. Great. Thank you, Patrick. So um, I, this, I guess this will close the formal part of the seminar and Q&A, and we'll move on to the more casual version. So if you would like to stay online and chat and comment, etc., I think the best thing to do